Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Healthcare Supply Chain Risk Management Webinar, sponsored by the American Institute of Healthcare Compliance. My name's Joanne Byron, and I'm so glad that you joined us today. The information that we're going to discuss today and the expertise that David's going to share with you, which he has a lot of it, it's not intended to be legal or consulting advice. Circumstances that surround your particular situation is unique and requires retaining a professional to provide appropriate guidance. Thank you very much, Joanne. So welcome everybody. Good uh, morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on where you are. Uh, let's go over today's agenda. So I'm going to give a brief introduction of myself, and then we're going to dive right into the importance of vendor vetting because that is a component of the supply chain risk management, and we'll kind of see how all that fits together. And then we'll talk about those key components of vendor vetting, and we'll, I'll go over a few questions that you can ask, and then I'm also gonna give you a link at the end that you can go and, I got a, a whole list of questions already made up in a PDF, and you can go download it. Uh, you don't have to enter your email address or anything. You just go to the link and download it. So uh, take advantage of that. Uh, after that, we'll go over understanding the supply chain risks and then a high level overview of how to actually implement a risk management framework. And of course, we can't do a deep dive in an hour, but we can give you a really good overview of what you need to do and how you need to do it. So first of all, uh, my name is David Sims. I am the owner and founder of Security First IT. It's a healthcare IT firm located in the Charlotte, North Carolina metro area. And we have clients all across the United States. Also have a company called HIPAA for MSPs. And we train other IT companies or managed service providers in how to handle HIPAA compliance within their own organization as well as for their clients. I'm also on the HHS 405D Cyber Working Group for the HICP, which is the Healthcare Industry Cybersecurity Practices that we publish and put out. And, uh, and also I have a podcast, a weekly podcast called Help Me With HIPAA. So if you are a podcast listener, go check that out. I think you'll like that. And lastly, and most importantly, I'm also a board member for the American Institute and proud to be that. All right, so let's dive in. Uh, before we go any further though, Joanne, I'm gonna go ahead and let you throw that first polling question up. Of course. All right. If everybody can participate, that would be great. Does your organization conduct supply chain risk assessments? Yes. Does your organization conduct supply chain risk assessments, either yes or no? And we might not be sure. See if you can, we'll give you a minute for everybody to participate and give us your answers. And then we'll share the results. All right, David, um, quite a few people, 53%, they're not sure. 13% say no, 34% say yes. Okay, very good. So 34% want to know if they're doing it right, and 13% want to know how to do it at all. <laughs> so we'll go over that uh, here. And uh, let's talk a little bit about vendor vetting versus supply chain risk management, because they, they are a little different, because not all vendors are part of your supply chain, and they have to be treated a little bit differently. So when you're going through vendor vetting, uh, one of the things that you're going to do basically is you're going to assess the individual vendor and there's things that you're going to look at and we'll go into that deeper in a little bit. Whereas with supply chain risk management, it's more of an ongoing program. So you're identifying the risk that a particular vendor brings and they are part of that supply chain of your organization. And then you're going to look at how you can manage that risk across the entire organization as well as the entire uh, supply chain. So that's the difference between the two, and they do kind of intertwine. So the importance of uh, vendor vetting, uh, I just went online and I just pulled some recent uh, things that have happened across healthcare uh, here lately. And some of you may have seen some of these. And if you have, then um, you can you can let me know in the chat. But 
is see in the a medical transcription service called Perry Johnson and Associates, PJ and A. They disclosed uh, a data breach that happened, and they disclosed it in May, but it actually happened uh, last year in 2023. And as you can see, they disclosed an 8.9 million patient uh, data breach. And uh, obviously, you can tell by the name that they're they're probably not a medical provider, since um, but they do provide medical transcription services. And then uh, Medical Care of North America. They are a dental benefits administration that provides services, and they announced a data breach of 8.8 .8 million uh, records. And then we go on down to WellTalk, which is a, a software as a service company, and they got hit by the Move It hack that happened uh, last year, and they had 8.4 million records. Uh, and when I say records, I mean patients. And then, as you can see, uh, the Pharmerica Corporation announced a 5.8 million uh, patient breach. And then Change Healthcare, anybody heard of that one? I would uh, anticipate all of you have. We don't even know the extent of that yet, but we're already seeing things about one in three Americans uh, across the United States. And so it's going to be a lot uh, that comes out of this one. And there's still a lot of fallout that's happening with that. So let's take a look at some other data that I pulled. So I went to the uh, OCR breach portal, and sometimes it's hard for me to remember to call it that because most of us call it the, the OCR wall of shame, uh, but they don't want us to call it that. So we'll call it the breach reporting portal. And so I went in uh, about three weeks ago and I pulled data for the last 12 months. And I said, give me, uh, give me a list of all the breaches of 500 or more patients that, and how they were reported. And so, as you can see here on that top right chart, uh, we have 67.5% of healthcare providers that reported data breaches. And then I, the one particular one I want you to look at is the business associates. So your business associates, these are people that are your vendors, uh, particularly if they are, uh, if they have access to PHI and they're using it in, to uh, create, receive, maintain, or transmit for your entity. And so we see that nearly 18% of those reported were business associates. Now, business associates can report on, on the behalf of the covered entity. And so we have to take that in consideration. If we look at the other chart, which is on the bottom left, we see that uh, within the healthcare providers, uh, we see that about, mm, say, 80 or so of those reported, of the 453, about 80 of those were reported uh, for the healthcare provider. So as you can see, there's a lot of things happening that are business associate related or vendor related or supply chain related where there are data breaches that are happening. And of course, when you take in consideration change healthcare, they were a business associate and a supply chain uh, partner across many, many, many different organizations. And, I, and this, these numbers here will change drastically once all that data comes in from, from that. So let's look at some of the components of vendor vetting. And, and these are some of the areas that I recommend that you look into. So when you have a vendor that's coming in, one thing I suggest you do is, is very early on, you go ahead and start vetting that vendor. In fact, until you really have a good idea whether or not they can pass your vetting, it doesn't really matter whether or not you can come to an agreement on a contract at that point, because you don't even know if they're going to be a good fit based on your vetting yet. I also recommend if they're a business associate and you're going to negotiate your business associate agreement, then you might as well do that up front as well. Because I've seen times where organizations have spent a lot of effort to uh, come to an agreement on the terms of a contract and what somebody's going to supply and how much it's going to cost. And then they can't come to an agreement on the business associate agreement. And so they have to either go find another vendor or start all over again. So if you start with these things in the beginning, then you can narrow down sometimes who your vendors need to be. So one thing to look at is compliance. Uh, do, do they fall under HIPAA? Not all vendors that deal with you will fall under HIPAA, but those that do, do they even know that? And if they do know that, are they doing the proper things to maintain the compliance that they should have in their organization? And thing, and do they know the things that they should be doing for you as well? Particularly on 
the side of cybersecurity and IT because there's a lot that goes into being able to do things that um, that are for the security rule. And if you have an IT vendor or if you're doing things internally, then you'll have different things that you'll have to do safeguard related for those. So that's a good thing to look at. The other is the data security piece of it. So what are they doing to protect the data that you've entrusted to them and ask them very specific questions. And we'll go into a few questions in just a minute. So incident response plan, do they have an incident response plan? What are they going to do if something happens and there's different levels and areas of incident you can look at? So you can look at incident response from like a technical situation. For example, a question might be, what is your organization going to do should you have a successful ransomware attack? And they don't have to give you these super deep details necessarily. You just want to know, do you have a plan? Have you tested your plan? Uh, or are you just going to try to wing it if something happens? You can ask about incident response plans for things like uh, extended power outages or some type of regional disaster. Maybe it's an earthquake or tornado, depending on where you live. Do you have incident response plans for those? And all these different questions are just giving you some idea of the maturity level of this vendor to be able to not become a bigger risk for your organization. So BCDR stands for Business Continuity and Disaster Recovery. So when it comes to those two things, particularly when you're talking with IT, th this is one of those areas where you're using the same phrases, but you're actually meaning something different because a lot of times when you're discussing things with IT, they're thinking about data backup. So when you say business continuity, disaster recovery, they're thinking, okay, this is uh, data that you want to back up and you want to back up your servers and your computers and you want us to recover that. But what we're talking about here is something different. We're talking about the actual continuity of business and recovering from a disaster to a point you can still see your patients and function as a business. So that goes beyond what an IT company or what your IT department is doing for you. They're getting you back up and running from a technology standpoint, but not necessarily fully uh, back in business um, to be able to see patients and have a continuity of care. So you want to ask that question. Deanna, you can unmute yourself. Okay. I was just going to comment about the change healthcare that I had heard about them from some other sister uh, agencies. That's okay. Um, so you're aware of change healthcare? Yes. Okay. There are some of the issues they had uh, with their clearinghouse. Right. Yeah, it was, uh, it is a, it, the largest and most disruptive data breach in healthcare to, in history so far. Yes. Um, and so, still having impacts for a yes, lot of facilities. Absolutely. It is. And uh, I think a lot of people did not realize how big and how deep uh, the tentacles were so to speak, of change healthcare until this happened. A lot of people didn't even know they were doing business with change health healthcare because they were doing it through another vendor and sometimes two or three vendors down and they didn't even realize that. So there, there's a lot coming to this. In fact, I saw something, I believe it was yesterday or maybe Monday, um, where uh, somebody in Congress, it was, I think a senator sent a pretty scathing letter to HHS about it and they want to know, well, you know, what are we going to do? We being HHS, what are we going to do to force these hospital systems and larger providers to start doing the right thing when it comes to cybersecurity and hold them accountable? Um, you know, I don't have all the answers to that for sure. That's a, that's a big boat to turn, so to speak. But, uh, you know, this whole thing would change healthcare. Uh, you know, if you're taking their word for it, basically happened because, they didn't have multi-factor authentication uh, on a service and somebody, you know, didn't turn that on or, or had turned it off or whatever the case might be. And then that, that enabled somebody to hack into the systems and then it just cascaded from there. So it's, it's just a big mess. All right. Uh, we'll move on to the next one. Number five insurance. So asking them about their cyber insurance coverage. Uh, if they have cyber insurance, they probably have had to attest that they're, that they have a lot of things already in place. So the fact that they've been issued cyber insurance is some indication that they're doing some things around protecting your data. 
and such, but that's a good question to ask and dive deeper into. Uh, then ask about their ongoing monitoring. So how are, how are they monitoring their own internal security, their own compliance? How are they uh, doing those things? What kind of program do they have set up? Or are they treating it like a kind of a one and done thing, which is, which is not what you want to hear. You want to hear that they're doing more than that. And then do they give you the ability to, to do periodic reviews? If they're, if they're pushing back against that, where they don't, they don't want to do periodic reviews or answer these questions with you, that's certainly a red flag. And so some of the questions you could ask, for example, and you don't have to write these down because there'll be, all these will be on the PDF that you can have access to at the end. Uh, one question asked is, do you have a formal information security program in place? And uh, is it using a standardized framework? For example, does it use the NIST cybersecurity framework or is it using the 405D uh, HICP framework, there's a CIS framework, there's all kinds of different frameworks that they can use, but you basically you want to know, are they using something that is a recognized framework and they're not just trying to use what they think is quote unquote best practices. Another question would be providing, provide evidence of the last completed risk analysis. And they can just give you like a summary page. They don't have to give you a detailed report, but when's the last time they they've done a risk analysis? Uh, do you have backup procedures uh, in use? And if so, what is the RTO and RPO? And I won't dive deep into those things, but basically you're looking at what is the recovery time objective and the recovery point objective. And if they have backup procedures in place, they should know what those terms mean and be able to give you feedback on those. Another question might be uh, asking them about what their patch management process is which is very important these days because if they're not patching their systems, that's how a lot of these hackers and criminals are being able to get into systems because when an organization announces a patch, uh, then that tells criminals, hey, there's a problem with this software and uh, there is a public patch available for it. But until somebody downloads that patch and applies it, it gives the criminals an opportunity to go and start attacking that vulnerability because they have to publish that vulnerability in order to, for people to patch it. And then uh, there's, there's other questions that you can ask as well. And, uh, but I'll move on to the next uh, slide and just, just know again that these questions and, and many more will be available in that PDF. David, this is a good time for us to do the second polling question. Yeah, let's jump into that one. Okay. All right. Has your organization suffered through a cyber incident causing a disruption in patient care in the past year? Yes. Yes, more than once. No. Or not that you're aware of. Okay. Hey, we're going to end the poll and share the results. Okay, so only 19% had a, a definite yes. I'm glad nobody had more than once. <laughs> That's interesting. I would have thought it would have probably been a little bit higher with the change healthcare being so disruptive. So that's interesting because um, I've had some people say that they, they had patients that couldn't get prescriptions uh, and, and so that was disruptive in that way. So their patient care was disrupted, even though they could still see patients, they couldn't give prescriptions out. So, but that's good. All right. So let's talk about supply chain risk management. And, and now we're going to get into, uh, going to kind of shift focus away from just specific vendor vetting and get into the overall framework of what supply chain risk management looks like. And this is a, th a 30,000 foot view and, and we'll dive in as deep as we can, given the time that we have. Uh, but I did go on the internet again, and I pulled some recent headlines, and some of you probably are familiar with some of these, but this is uh, these are very recent. So we have supply chain shortages impacts patient care and provider workflows. I'm sure a lot of you probably experienced some of that, particularly in the height of COVID during 2020, 2021. Uh, hospitals face mounting shortages of essential medical supplies. In the face of national drug shortage, U.S. must bolster supply chains, surge in supply chain shortages, disrupting hospital operations, and then lastly, the AMA, 80% of docs have lost revenue amid disruptions, 
from Change Healthcare Cyber Attack. This is this article is why I thought that uh, percentage would have been a lot higher in, in the poll because of the 80% of docs had lost revenue. And unfortunately, we've even seen some practices go out of business during that because they couldn't get revenue in fast enough and they couldn't make pay payroll. So it's um, it's it's been bad. Okay, so let's take a look at what it looks like overall. We're going to dive into each one of these, but this is what the the risk management process looks like if you were to to map it out. And I'm pulling all this information from what's called HIC Scrim. So that's H I C S C R I M, which is the see if I can get it right now. The Help Information Cybersecurity Supply Chain Risk Management. Uh, guide version two. There we go. <laughs> and uh, so if you just, if you Google that uh, Hick Scrim, then you'll be able to find this guide that I'm talking about. And it's put out by the health sector council and it's freely available. And it goes through uh, everything that we'll be talking about today. And so we'll dive into this a little bit. So the first thing we want to do when we uh, are building this framework is we want to define uh, who the who the suppliers are, and we want to understand what the key risk that those suppliers bring to our organization. And so we'll start by defining what those risks are, and we'll look at each one of these. So we'll start with the operational risk. So from an operational risk, we're looking at what are the risks that can impact our day-to-day -day operations. And then we want to look at safety risks, and that's, that could be safety to patients, it could be safety to employees, contractors, et cetera. Another risk would be the competitive risk of your organization. So things like intellectual property, trade secrets, any kind of go-to-market plans, those, those things are important because they can impact your ability to achieve your organizational goals. Next, we want to look at the quality risk. And so this can be quality of care, it can be quality of a product, quality of a service. Those things could be uh, sabotaged and those things can impact your quality of care uh, in the services that your organization provides. Next, the reputational risk. So we all have reputational damage that can happen should something happen. You know, certainly when you have a data breach in your organization, there's a, a lot of fallout that can happen uh, reputationally. And so it can impact the business. It can cause loss of customers and patients. It can cause loss of business partners, public confidence, and your perceived image of your organization. All those things can be impacted. Next, we have uh, the compliance risk. And so you have obviously compliance failures that can happen that can uh, result in losses of revenue, legal penalties. If you can't uh, comply with those laws and regulations, and it's more than just HIPAA. It's there are other regulations that can uh, come into play, and you have state and federal regulations that you have to abide by, depending on the organization. And so all these things are highly dependent on each and individual organization, which is why we can't dive deep into anything really specific going through this. But just know that your organization might be different from somebody else's who's on the webinar. You have secondary risk that can be risk that. Uh, another business partner brings in or a business uh, associate kind of brings into the mix. And then lastly, we have the geopolitical risk. So when things are instable, uh, unstable, uh, or they have trade barriers or tax barriers or any kind of things happening that are geopolitical, it could be uh, within the United States or other parts of the world, those things can bring risk as well. One thing to, to look at that that kind of hits home for me in the IT world is that we have a lot of uh, we have a lot of vendors that outsource to places like the Philippines and India and uh, sometimes Venezuela and stuff like that. And so any kind of geopolitical things that are happening, I'm always concerned about how that might ripple uh, throughout our industry. And so those are the things that you want to look for there. And once you've defined what those risks are and you understand those risks, the next thing you want to do is you want to uh, set the the tone in, of the communication for who is going to be in charge of this. And so you want to align with the vision, the goals, and what your milestones and metrics are 
for that so that you can have hopefully somebody within the the leadership of your organization can come in and take ownership of this because uh, if it's not something that leadership gets behind, it's going to be very, very difficult for you to get any traction on this. So that's that's why that's uh, very necessary. And once you have those key areas, the next thing we want to do is we want to understand what I call it, what our treatment options are. And because anytime we have a risk, we do have options of of what we do with those risks and how we decide to uh, to deal with those. And so Here's a few options that we have. We have the ability to either uh, mitigate the risk so we can implement some type of compensating control to make sure that we have done everything we can to bring that risk down. We can transfer the risk and that can be something like, for example, cyber insurance, some type of uh, third party vendor we might be able to transfer that to. But let me caution you though, you can't, you can't always transfer a risk, even though you, you might think you are. And the reason I say that is I had a recent conversation with somebody and they were talking about uh, a ransomware attack. And the gentleman made a comment that, well, we, we hired your organization to transfer that risk to. And I said, well, let's think about that for a second. If you hired us, uh, to transfer the risk of a ransomware attack, what you're saying is should somebody attack your organization, then they're really going to attack our organization. So our computers would be ransom and not yours. And he, he said, well, it doesn't really work that way. Does it? And I said, no, it does not. I said, you can hire us to help mitigate those risks down to an acceptable level, but you can't transfer that risk over to us. Now, in some cases you can do it. Uh, like for example, with cyber insurance, you can transfer the financial risk of say, for example, breach notification. You can try and transfer that over to insurance because you have insurance to cover that. And so that would be transferring the financial risk over to insurance. So there is ways, there are ways to do that, but just understand when you say you're transferring the risk, really understand what that means. Are you truly transferring a risk? And even if you do transfer the risk, you're, you're not always and rarely are you transferring the uh, the accountability for that and who needs to manage that. So keep that in mind. Next, you can accept the risk. You can just say, hey, I, we're good with it. We're, we're okay with it. And if you mitigate things down to an acceptable level, then that's what you really kind of want to get to. Like we, this is an area now we're good with. So we can, um, we can be okay to move forward. And then lastly, you can avoid the risk altogether. And depending on the risk, uh, type and what it is, you might be able to do that. And then again, you might not, but if you can avoid the risk and then completely avoid it, if it's a vendor we're, that we're talking about here, and this particular vendor is bringing a risk that another vendor doesn't, then obviously changing vendors and, and deciding not to use that vendor that has that risk would be, would be a way to avoid it. And so those are your four options that you can pick from and you can, you can decide whichever one you want to do, but Ultimately, you do want to get things down to a level that you can accept it. And let me also tell you that you should be documenting your entire process uh, through this whole thing, because you want to document how you came to these conclusions, how you made these decisions, document how you mitigated these risks, or if you transferred them or accepted them or whatever you did, make sure you're documenting these things. Not only is it important for your uh, supply chain risk management program, but it's also going to be very important should something happen and you have to either answer to an audit or you have to answer to an investigation when something happens. You want to be able to provide this data because then it becomes evidence as to what your organization has or has not done when it comes to these things. Okay, so once we have that, we want to look a little bit at the life cycle of a um, um, of your program. So the life cycle would be when, when you decide that you're going to have a supply uh, risk management platform or, or, or a program in your business, you want to understand how it, how it functions and how it should be set up and structured within your organization. So we'll take the top right corner first in that quadrant. We'll start with the people because it's always, it's always all about the people. So it's the people, people. So when it comes to, to, to that, I mentioned this earlier, but we want to make sure that you do assign someone in leadership or someone on the executive team 
to really sponsor this effort to get behind it and push it. And that's how you're going to get the best traction uh, for your supply chain risk management program. And then make sure you understand if whether or not you need other staffing or other people that have different skills that you can bring in and then train those stakeholders, whoever they might be, train them to make sure they can provide continual awareness of the program. So it's, it's very much similar to like a, uh, a cybersecurity awareness program or a compliance awareness program. It's the same kind of thing where you want your, your uh, people in your organization to understand how to identify what the risks are and then how to report that to somebody so that you can enter that into your program. So you can, you've identified what the risk is and then you can take action based on your program uh, on those risks. So you make, you make sure you, you train the stakeholders to do that. The next in the bottom uh, right hand quadrant, we have process. So on the process side of things, what we want to do is we want to, uh, again, we want to establish the governance that the executive committee uh, provides and you want them to monitor the health of the overall program and look at it from, from a strategic direction and resourcing so they can make sure that they're putting the right people in the right places to have that done. And then also look at operational governance and that is dealing with the performance of the plan the the issue management so what happens when people identify issues and risk and how those are going to be managed the coordination of activities would be another area they would uh they would manage and then they could include other assessments and other audits that support your efforts also you, this in this area of process you want to make sure that you have somebody uh either a person or a uh, or arm of your firm or your organization that can come in and they can maintain a, a current supplier inventory. And so understanding who your suppliers are is very, very important. And, and if you have somebody who is in charge of the supplier relationships, then bring them into that conversation and then track and communicate with those suppliers. And if you don't know how to find your suppliers, then we'll cover some of that um, in a little bit. Next is tooling. So with tooling, that's where you want to establish, uh, you know, where are you going to keep this data? So are you going to keep it in a spreadsheet? Are you going to keep it in Excel? Or is it going to be in like an ERP program or a CRM? But understanding where to keep everything and put everything in one place is, is very, very important. Because oftentimes what I've seen is you'll have somebody who starts using one particular tool and then they switch over to another type of tool and, or you have different departments that are using different tools. So just establish that single authoritative database that you're going to use for your suppliers and, and harmonize that across your entire uh, program. So uh, after tooling, we have the controlling aspect of it. And, and the controlling part is where you're just collecting that data. So what, what internal metrics and measures are you going to use? What are the KPIs you're going to have in place? And uh, how are you going to do the external benchmarking? And that's, that would be where you engage in um, looking at the vendors and what kind of programs and processes they have in place and then determine their risk levels. And that's where we start getting into uh, prioritizing the, uh, the vendors that you have. And so when we look at prioritizing the things we want to do is, for example, figure out who, who we should be most aware of this bringing risk. And so there are several different ways you can do this. So one way you can, you can do this is by pulling your accounts payable and look at what vendors are being paid. If you pull your accounts payable, you should get a pretty good idea of who most of your vendors are. And you'll also get an idea about of how much money that you're paying them. And, and it gives, it gives them uh, a risk score based on how much uh, business you do with them and maybe how big of a supplier they are to your organization. Next is your business associate agreement. So hopefully you've got business associate agreements with in place with everybody that you should have, but pulling those is also a good way to look and see who your suppliers are and who your vendors are. So now you've got accounts payable, you've got business associate agreements. You can also pull contracts. 
uh, to see who your vendors might be. You can look at IT uh, inventory to see who some of them are. Look at your uh, procurement information. Uh, look at value added reseller information. And so all of these things, and if you have a current ERP system or enterprise resource planning system, if you have that, then go ahead and look at that. But take all of that information and pull all this together and you should get a really good idea of who your suppliers are. And then from that point, we want to look at uh, the, the actual priority of that supplier. And that's going to be different across uh, all organizations because if you've got a supplier or vendor that you have a very high annual spend on, for example, and the, you have a lot of money that's going out of the organization to pay this vendor, then you have to make a determination. Is this vendor uh, critical to our organization? Are they high, medium, or low? So what, what is the impact to our organization should something happen to this vendor? And that, that's, that's the initial question you want to ask. And then you use all this information that you pull to make a determination as to whether or not they fall into one of those four categories. Another area to consider is their access to sensitive or confident, confidential data. So do they access a PHI? What do they do with that PHI? It, it, you know, should something happen to that, that vendor, we're gonna take IT for example, should something happen to my IT vendor, whoever that might be, it could be Microsoft, it could be a local IT vendor, then what is the impact to my organization should that happen? Another thing to, to ask a question on is what about patient risk? So, and this is where you can bring the clinicians in to ask because they can provide valuable input and they can help you rate any potential impact to patient risk that that vendor may provide to your organization. The next one is revenue impact. So if that is something happened to these particular vendors in your list, what impact to the revenue of the organization would it have? Next, operational impact or business criticality. So what kind of impact would it have, would it have there? Then the next one would be regulatory compliance impact. And then lastly, reputational impact. So you've got all these different areas that you can then use to prioritize your vendors and your suppliers. And then you ask the question of, should something happen to these organizations? What would be the impact of those? And some of them are going to be very low. Some of them are going to be critical. And what you should see is you should see something that's similar to this. Uh, you're going to have probably you know, 70% or so of your suppliers are going to be down at the, the low level. And then you're going to, it's going to go up like a pyramid and you'll have 1% or so that's going to be very, very critical to your organization. And depending on how you rate these will depend on how you handle them. So for example, when you, when you see how we do this risk tiering here, what you're going to notice is that for those folks, uh, hold on a second. Click there. There we go. For those folks that are on the bottom, you notice that it's basically saying that you can do a self uh, attestation with them, and then you can just you know be aware that they're out there, but they they have very low impact to your organization, so you're not too worried about them. And then as you go up, you see that there's more and more work that you have to do to make sure that you are assessing them properly and that you stay in touch with them as far as. Uh, how they're doing in their own program and making sure that they have, they're, they're keeping their risk to your organization as low as possible. And then you see on the high side, you see that you want to ensure their security posture and you want to continuously communicate and do risk updates with that organization because they, they have a massive impact to your organization should something happen. And so that's how you want to tier your suppliers and your vendors to make sure that you understand the risk that they bring to your organization. Because if you don't understand the risk level they bring to your organization, you treat everybody the same and you're, it's not going to work out very well for you because you want to know who the people that you need to pay the most attention to. So when it comes to a risk assessment, here are uh, multiple ways that you can, you can look at that and, um, and engage whether or not uh, they bring a certain level of risk to your organization. So one would be through the cybersecurity uh, policies and awareness. So do they have those things in place? And a lot of this stuff, if you, 
you may or may not recognize this, but a lot of this is coming through the 405D uh, HICP framework. So it kind of maps over to that. Uh, asset change uh, or asset and change management is extremely important. I see a lot of data breaches that actually happen because uh, this area is not being well taken care of. So with asset and change management, the area that I see here that is uh, is most concerning is the is when there are software and or hardware that is not decommissioned properly. And so assets being devices and computers and such, they are not uh, they're not properly disposed of. And so these things end up in all kinds of areas. I've seen them for sale on eBay. I've seen them in um, in local stores even. Uh, I had years ago, I had a client that was retiring and I called the doctor up and I said, I, you know, I know that you're retiring in another month and you're going to be closing your private practice down and I need to schedule a time to come in and properly decommission your computers and let's do a secure data wipe on them and make sure all that PHI is, is uh, completely destroyed or backed up so that you can store that somewhere. And uh, unfortunately, his response to me was, uh, I donated those to Goodwill already. So, yeah, not good. But that's a, a good example of how the uh, access management can be very critical. With access control, this is where we're discussing who has access to what. So if you're not controlling access to data properly, you can definitely have a misuse of information or access to information that you shouldn't have. Network security, this is becoming a bigger, bigger challenge, especially since COVID happened because people have started working from home a lot more. And it is very difficult, if not impossible, to have network security that covers people everywhere they go. And so that's why the next one, which is endpoint protection, is so important. So an endpoint is any point uh, where data uh, can be found and it is it is a connection to your either network or to your data or to your organization. So uh, an endpoint is a fancy way of saying the PC or the laptop or the Mac or whatever it might be, smartphone, all those are endpoints within an organization. And so how are they being protected? The next one I would argue is is one of the most important and the one I don't see a lot of people uh, spending a lot of resources on yet, which is email protection, uh, which is crazy in a way because more than 80% of successful cybersecurity attacks uh, or cyber attacks and data breaches even uh, come through email. So they come through phishing, uh, email, and other types of uh, attacks, and they all come through email. So if you're going to put and if you're going to invest in protection, the email protection would be definitely one I would I would put some money in for sure and put some resources toward. The next one is vulnerability and patch management. Uh, we talked about patch management a little bit earlier, but certainly being able to understand what the vulnerabilities are within the organization. And we're talking technical vulnerabilities mostly here uh, because not IT doesn't always uh, cover every single piece of equipment that you have in your organization, because there are medical devices that don't fall under a typical IT management, or in some cases there are medical devices that are running some type of firmware or operating system that they don't even want you to update. And so having, uh, understanding where those are, what those are, what vulnerabilities they may bring to the organization and can you patch them? And if so, how do you patch them? Uh, those are big questions to be asked. And then lastly, we already covered this uh, is the incident response piece, making sure that they have the incident response piece in place. Okay, so next we want to do the risk management and reporting. So now that you've got the, the list of your vendors and your suppliers in place and you've and you figured out what priority to put them in and, and the impact they're going to have to your organization, uh, next, you want to give them a risk score. And so you want to determine, are they high risk? Are they medium risk? Are they low risk? And you do that through all the factors that we've already provided. And after you've done that, you need to figure out, okay, now that we've got these, we understand that these vendors are high, medium, or low risk. Now we're back to our 
four options again. Are we going to accept the risk that, these, that this vendor provides or this supplier provides? Are we going to mitigate it and try to, to work with that vendor to get those risks down? Do we transfer that or can we avoid it all together? So you, you're back to the same four uh, uh, questions you need to ask yourself about which ones that you want to uh, be able to accept within your organization. And you do that for every single supplier that you have. And then lastly, what you'll do after you've done that is you have to decide which of your vendors and suppliers are going to have an ongoing due diligence. And for those who, who are more critical to your organization, you should certainly do these at least annually. So you want to go back to them and ask questions about what are they doing for their own internal risk management. And there are a lot of folks right now that are implementing AI across their organization. They're implementing AI within the software. And so even though you may have talked to some of these vendors as recently as a year ago, they may not have been doing some of these things with AI that they're doing now. So now they're bringing even more risk to their organization by using AI and in turn bring risk to your organization. So you have to understand what that looks like. Yet just yesterday, I saw someone posting uh, online that they were, they were a doctor and they worked for an organization and they didn't give the name, but they were uh, basically bragging about how much they use AI and specifically chat GPT. And the, the doctor went, went on to say how he was feeding all this patient information into chat, B, chat GPT. And it was giving him back all this data and, and these results by comparing and contrasting things, which is great. But the problem is he doesn't have a business associate agreement with, with, um, with chat GPT folks. <laughs> he shouldn't be giving them this information. And so now you have a, uh, a disclosure that should not be happening uh, to this organization and he's doing it. So that's just, that's just one problem. So not only do you have, in this case, not only do you have a risk that a supplier might bring in, but you also have the risk in your organization from your own internal staff using something that they should not be using or that hasn't been vetted yet, or that you don't have business associate agreements set up with yet or whatever the case might be. So there's, there's always these risks internally and externally. And then uh, lastly, once you've decided how you're going to treat that vendor, then you need to have a way that you're tracking and reporting those issues that come up. So any, anything that comes up, whether it's internal issues or external to your supply chain or your vendors, have some way that you're tracking those issues, whether it's a ticketing system or an ERP system, or whether it's a database that you're using, but you've got some way that you're keeping track of all that information. And then this is what it looks like again. So this is, we went through the whole supply chain management process from uh, identifying who your supply chain vendors are, then making sure that you uh, rate them as far as they priority first. And then that way, you know who to deal with and whether or not they're a low priority uh, or a critical priority based on the impact they are to your organization. And then you want to feed that through the ways that you can assess the risk that they bring to your organization. After you do that, you want to assign them a risk score and you can just do high, medium, low, or you can do one, two, three, or however you want to do it. After you assign them the risk score, then you know whether or not you want to treat that risk in one of these four areas, which is to accept, mitigate, transfer, or avoid. And then this is a continual process and it's, it's something that you don't stop. So that's why it's called risk management, not a, it's not a risk task. So it's, it's a, it's not a task that you complete. It's like a chronic condition that you treat. There you go. There's my rhyming for today. I know in some cases, the supply chain shortage was actually people, like you couldn't get enough people to work. And so that's, uh, that's an impact to an organization as well, because that certainly impacts patient care is in customer service and all these other things when you don't have enough bodies in the room. All right. So let's recap real quick. Uh, so understand that vendors do bring risks and people that are part of your supply chain, organizations that are part of your supply chain, they also bring risk risk. They do equal 
patient care and safety issues. And then, uh, as I mentioned, risk is not a problem that you solve. It's a problem that you manage. Therefore, having a risk management program is an absolute must in, in any organization, not just healthcare, but we certainly need that in healthcare as well. And as I promised, if you want to get that free vendor vetting PDF, you can go to that URL there, securityfirstit.com slash vendor. It's not going to ask you for your email address or anything. So uh, just go there and you'll be able to download that PDF and it's going to give you um, several pages of questions that you can ask to help you vet your vendors. So if anybody wants to, uh, wants to reach out to me, that's my contact information there. And uh, if you have any other questions about this topic or any other topic around uh, healthcare IT, I'd be more than happy to try my best to answer. I appreciate it.